Too many times we stand aside and let the water slip away till what we put off to tomorrow has finally come today. So don't stand upon the shoreline and say you're satisfied. Choose to chance the rapids and dare to dance the tide. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Ivey, known around the world as The Blind Blogger. And I'm here with another episode of my show, What's Your Excuse? And I have another uh, very interesting, inspiring, motivating woman with me today. And I'm looking very much forward to talking with her. Uh, her name is Tina Murray. And as you will tell in a minute when she starts talking, she's from Australia. And she considers herself an interior decorator showing people how to change their lives from the inside out, drawing on their uh, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects of their body. And uh, she's an author, speaker, workshop producer, director. And basically, if this has to do with inspiring and motivating you to change your life and become a better person, she's probably done it, doing it, or going to. So welcome to the show. How are you doing today, Tina? Wow, I'm amazed after that introduction. Thank you so much. That was divine. You can do my introductions from now on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'm always glad when I get it right because more often than not, I get it wrong, but I just go with it. And I have told people this many times. If you want to feel good about yourself, do an interview because, and on a show where they, where they really put, their, put, put effort into the intro or write your own intro. That's even better. You know, mm -hmm. pick your theme music, write your own intro, mm -hmm. and say it out loud. That's a really cool exercise I like to get people to do. It's also really fun to see what they come up with. So why don't you, before I get, <laughs> before I I get I love what else? I just love the, the song that you did. That is perfect. That is right up my alley. Like, don't sit on the shoreline. Get out there and go do it. I, it's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, it kind of stuck with me the first time I heard it in 1993, actually. It's, a, it's part of a Garth Brooks song called The River, and it's, uh, it's become my theme mm -hmm. song. It's my go-to song when, if somebody asks me at the end of an interview if I want to sing something. That's the song I go to. I've actually got to find some new music because I think they're getting tired of hearing that one. But it is, it is really perfect right? for, for somebody who's into coaching and, and you know, changing and not, like you say, not sitting on the sidelines and waiting for tomorrow. So, so why don't you, so why don't you tell people a little bit about who Tina Murray is and what your background is and how you got to be this person who uh, helps others redecorate their lives. Yeah, sure. So my background is interior design and that for me was always about the people. So if you think about it, if I'm designing your house, Max, I'm designing specifically for you and what your needs are and they're going to be very different from someone else's. And I was made redundant during the financial crisis in 2010 and was made redundant with one week's pay because I hadn't been working yeah. in this place very long. I was divorced. I was single. I had a mortgage that was bigger than my house and <laughs> I had no backup plan and I needed to um, really reassess my life. And very quickly, basically that night, I had a gorgeous friend come over. Her name was Leanne. And we sat on the floor and we had a bottle of wine. And she goes, oh, oh I feel so sorry for you. What are you going to do? And I went, you know what? This is going to be all right. And it came out of my mouth with, I just knew it at that point. And it wasn't the wine talking. <laughs> there was something more than that. And from there, I just realized I needed to start living life on my terms. And so I started applying for jobs. And what happened for me partway through while I was looking for more interior design jobs is I went to this one particular interview and I was listening to the person talking and I was thinking, I don't fit this company. I'm actually going to hate living here, but I have to take this job if they offer it to me because I need the money. And so I had this whole eternal dialogue going on about, okay, well, what's really important? Is being miserable more important than having money or vice versa? And that night I went to a dinner party and I said to the people who were there, I think I'm about to be offered this job and I actually don't want it. And they said to me, how do you know that you don't want that job? And I'm like, how do you not know? 
<laughs> and as I started having the same conversation with more people, I realised a lot of people aren't clear about what it is they need. And that comes back to our interior. Now, as I said, as an interior designer for people's properties and for commercial businesses and retail, I, it was always about the people for me and what they wanted and getting in touch with what their needs were. And it was never about me and my ego. And it's the same when now when I design people's lives with them, what exactly do people want and how can we get you to know what it is you want so you could be as clear as I was when I was at that job interview? That's very interesting. It sounds like the, t it sounds like the way I was approaching it when I took that job with the Internal Revenue Service back in 92 that I ended up ended up hating, but it was one of those, if they offer you the job, how can you not take mm -hmm. the job, you know? Um, and mm -hmm. was, it, was it a case of just really knowing or was it a case of that was the only job you saw being offered to you at the time? Um, it was a combination of both. I was going to whatever interviews that I could get at the time. It was financial crisis, interior designers weren't in high demand. And um, so there weren't that many job offers at the time, but I, so I was going to the ones where they'd come and want to chat to me. But it was really obvious for me that I wasn't going to fit this company. Thankfully, they didn't offer me the job, and so <laughs> I didn't have to make that decision. But what happened for me... <laughs> but the beauty for me is I was... Um, a place that I used to work asked me to come back for two days, and I ended up staying there for five years. But I worked there on my terms. And so it changed my whole perspective about what a job was for me. And so for, for my case, I realised I wanted to break more into this coaching thing and help other people understand their own needs and wants. But I still needed to be earning some money. So working with this interior design company, we worked together about the hours that I worked. And when they asked me to be full time, I said, no, sorry, not interested. That's not part of what I want to do. I would take two months worth of holidays a year. Like I really worked out what was important to me at that time. And the company worked with me on that. So part of that was because I was really clear about what I wanted. And I delivered a service to them too. It wasn't like I you know, was asking all these demands and couldn't also follow through with what they needed. It sounds like two things happened there. One, it sounds like you were able to get really clear with what you wanted, but also the company knew exactly what they wanted and y'all were able to communicate this to each other in, a, in a, an environment that allowed you to come mm. to an arrangement that worked for everybody. Uh. Exactly. And I mean, I'm working more and more with companies that understand they need to look after their staff. I mean, retention is such a huge, uh, you know, turnover costs are huge. It takes two years really to replace an employee when you look at the costs of refinding re someone else, the cost of all that information that's gone with them. It takes a long time for people to get up to scratch. So companies are recognising, number one, they need to look after their staff. Millennials in particular, but the rest of us are also looking to be, you know, happy. We understand we want to have a bit more of whatever our, our idea of balance is in our lives. And so I've, I'm finding more and more companies are coming to the party with, with recognising their staff do have needs which are beyond just earning the money. Right. Now, I forgot to mention this at the beginning when I did your intro. Uh, people can find you at tinamurray.com, which is T-I-N-A-M-U-R-R-A-Y. Um, and uh, how do you get to this point where you know exactly what it is that you need? Is there, is there some sort of, of, of exercise or trick that you can teach other people so they can figure it out? Because it is so true. Once you know what it is you need and once you know what success looks like to you from, from those, it makes it a lot easier to get there. Mm, for sure. Look, there's a lot of techniques that I use. And as I said, like any design job, it's tailored specifically for what the people are needing. But the thing I find really interesting is once we might be working on one part of someone's life, but once they start to understand their values, what their spiritual needs are, their mental needs are, their financial needs are, their physical needs are, their emotional needs are, it starts to trickle over into other parts of their lives. And so there's a knock-on effect. And it takes work. It takes getting in touch with some sides of you that you really may not want to get in touch with. But it's part of, you know, how we get through to the other side. And this work never finishes. I plan to be 100 and still be learning about myself and still 
uh, trying to understand a bit more about how my life works. But one thing coming back to, one thing I find which is a really quick one, which works really quickly for a lot of people, and I use it on my own podcast with my guests, is I ask people, where do you see yourself in 50 years? And the reason I do that is because it takes people from the everyday to 50 years in advance. At the moment, if someone has school children, if I said, what do you want to be like in five years, they're still caught up in where they're at now. They'd be saying, oh, well, my kid will be 13 and they'll be starting high school and oh, I need to be able to do this and et cetera. So you're caught up in where you're at now. And if you jump to 50 years, you start to look at it like I look at a plan from an overhead point of view. You really are looking down and going, what's important to me? What is it I really want? Who are the people I want around? What do I want to achieve? What's going to make me feel like I've lived a really good life? So it's more about legacy. And once people get that, and it's amazing watching the our home, our home moments, even when I'm doing it on my podcast, there's a number of people who have just gone like, oh, wow, oh, oh. And then that it's really made them really reassess. And I've got some amazing feedback from that on how People have actually rethought what they're doing and what's important and why waste time on stuff that's not important now. Yeah, I really hated that question. <laughs> uh, why did you hate it? Because I have so little idea of what I'm doing next week, much less what I'm doing 50 years from now. It's just, it's just one of those questions. I just hated that question. <laughs> oh, good to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's that's one of the best lessons we can teach is how we how we do things when we are uncomfortable or when we are scared, yeah. and that's that's another reason why I do why I sing in my intros and my outros is because it's one of those things that putting my voice out there in public still bothers me, and mm -hmm. it's I'm more nervous about people not liking my singing than I am about them not liking my writing if that tells you anything about it at all. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So when you do these, when you, when you work with people, what do you find is the most difficult for them to get through to? Is it financial? Is it, uh, is it their, uh, is it personal? Is it, is it spiritual? Is it job? Is it, uh, the people they allow into their lives? What is the thing that usually causes people the most problems when you're working with them? It's interesting because, as I said, everything really is interrelated. And once you start to get one bit, it does trickle over into other parts of your life. But a lot of the people I work with are in their late 40s and 50s. And I actually work with a lot of men. And they often they've been quite successful and they've done all the right things. You know, they've gone to university, they've got married, they've had kids, they've had the successful career. Some of them have been in that, that career for 30 years and are bored out of their brains that they don't <laughs> feel like they can do anything else. Um, and for a number of them, not all of them, but a number of them come to me when their relationships are breaking up or have broken up. And for them, it's been like, you know what, I thought I was doing the right thing. I can now see that, yes, providing for my family was really important. And I, I know why that was important to me and why it was part of what I felt I needed to do. But in doing that, it meant me working the late hours. I mean, I didn't see my kids grow up. I lost my connection with my partner. And so often it's people going, this isn't working for me and I need to do something different. I don't know what it is and I don't necessarily need to go and buy a Ferrari. I can find another way to turn <laughs> this good life <laughs> around so that I can look back on the rest of our life. And I think the other thing with that age group is a lot of us at that age are finding our parents are getting older. So a real sense of... Um, our mortality and, well, what am I going to do in the tw next 20, 30, 50 years? Like, what really is important? Because this stuff's just stuff. Yeah. While you were talking, I was thinking to myself, there really isn't, uh, there's a, the difference between men and women in this area is, is, a, is, is a difference in what their purpose was for the most part. Mm -hmm. But about that same time period, you have women who are no longer raising children and you have men who are no longer considered most valued at their work. So you have two different groups of people for different reasons, but they're still wondering what they're going to do next. Exactly. And it's about that fulfillment. So it's not always, for the guys who have been in the same job for 30 years, it's not about them quitting their job. Let's find a way that they can get fulfillment elsewhere or how can we bring part of what they really love back into their job? So maybe it's they plan a, I don't know, a trip to bicycle ride around Italy. 
if that's something that's going to um, really is something they've been looking to do and it fits with their purpose and what they feel like they've missed out on, let's just turn that around. Because once you've come back from doing something like that, you really feel like you can um, start to take on other things that you haven't. And, you know, even your trip to New York, Max, it's a great example of, you know, now you're talking about traveling the world. It's a great example of you do this one step as something that's important to you and you think, you know what, I'm going to do this. And then you see where you have been brave, where you've been frightened, where you have found a side of yourself that you'd forgotten that existed. And you can then bring that back and apply that to other areas of your life. Yep. That is, that is so true. It is. Uh, the problem is, is that once you do take that, that one, that one thing, um, you start seeing, you start seeing more opportunities to challenge mm -hmm. yourself. And mm -hmm. for somebody who's in a job that they don't really care for, I could see that being a big point of frustration. Mm. Yep. And one of the things I did years ago with quite a young woman who was working late hours and didn't want to do it is we just, after the Christmas break, we just trained her to train everybody else in her company that she wasn't staying back late. And so we did it in a gradual process where she was um, booking nights out with her friends because she's the sort of person who wasn't going to cancel on her friends. One of her values is to be on time and to be, you know, do what she says she's going to do. So it was really easy for us to go, okay, well, you book in a night out with your mates. That means you have to leave the office at six o'clock. So you're going to make sure that happens. So to start with, let's do that quite a bit at the beginning. So people start to see that you're not staying back. It also made her more efficient in how she was working because, again, when you know what's important, you don't do the stuff that doesn't have to be done. You do what's important and needs to be done that day. So in, within about two months, she wasn't staying back late all the time for two reasons. One, she'd trained herself, but she'd also trained, she felt people had expectations that she should be staying back. So she trained herself to be resilient to that, and she also trained them that she wasn't going to be doing that. <laughs> Isn't that the way it is with a lot of people? We are more, we, we, will, we will put ourselves out to avoid disappointing mm -hmm. or standing other people up. And when it comes down to a choice between not making it to an appointment with, with friends or family that you promised to be at versus being at work, uh, it makes it a little easier to get past that, that, that block and actually take mm -hmm. action to make it happen. I, I know for me personally, I feel, I have, I have often uh, been late on posting to my own blog because I promised somebody else I would write for their site. Sure. Yep. And the thing, that, and it's, it's great. I mean, especially if your value is to be on time, which, which is always mine, but it's not necessarily for everyone. But if something's really important to you, you do need to do that. But as you're saying, does it actually, is it detrimental to you? So it's about that balance about what is important and where can you actually say no? Now, writing blogs, you love doing, so that's fine that you can do both. But other people are taking on things just because they can't say no. Whereas when you start to realise what's important to you, it gives you a barometer and permission. I feel like my main job is to give people their own permission <laughs> to actually go and do what it is that they want. And in a lot of cases, that is that really hard one of learning how to tell people no. Mm -hmm. Which is so hard. It's so hard. But I've, I've got a saying that, you know, the, the most important person you're meant to say no to, uh, if you're saying no to others, you're saying no to yourself. I'll say it much better than that, but that's the gist of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I personally find it, find it very healthy that we're seeing more and more uh, online people talking about how um, uh, protecting, about, about saying no to other people is is protecting yourself and mm. giving yourself the the energy, the time, the money to to keep doing whatever it is that you love doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's important because, again, coming back to that 50 years' time, which, let's face it, for many of us might be a deathbed time, we need to be able to go, wow, yeah, I achieved all of this and I did look after the people I cared for and I looked after myself and I'm proud of it. Yep. Uh, now you are also an author and a speaker. Could you could you tell people something about your book? Yeah, sure. So it's called Design You, Create the Life You Want. And it came about back in 2010 when I did lose that job. 
And I talked about the processes that I use to get in touch with what I valued, why I valued that, what all my needs were, again, the physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, financial, and then taking in further steps about what are my strengths? What am I not good at? And that's okay. I don't have to be good at everything, but how can I use my strengths or delegate the other stuff? about getting a support network, people who can really cheer you on, about understanding gratitude and how we can be grateful for other people and give back. And so it was a series of, um, these are the things that helped me was why I wrote it. And it took me four years to put it out because I had this thought, well, who am I to tell people what to do? And I shared it with someone, an acquaintance of mine who was really miserable in her job. And I said, you know what, do you mind just reading this manuscript and give me feedback on it? And she rang me a few days later, her name was Maria, and she said to me, she, I picked up the phone and she said, I'm quitting my job. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm like, oh, do you want to think about this? Uh, you, know, is, you know, is that a bit drastic? Do you want to find something else and then move? No, nope, no, nope, I've read your book. They are killing me. It doesn't align with anything that's important to me. I have to get out. I've realised I have to get out. I'm like, okay, so there's something in this. <laughs> and so from there, I started to publish it. <laughs> yes. Um, for, it, took you, it took you four years. When do you feel, how long do you feel it was between when you finished, let's call, the, let's call it the writing part of the book, mm -hmm. and when you finally published it? How long did you hang on to it before you, before you had this moment where you well, that, realized it was That was, was the worthy? four years. Yeah, that was the I wrote it very quickly. I, again, coming back to me knowing what I wanted to do, when I felt the need to write, and I love writing, it's one of my favourite things in the world, I just go into this other place. I negotiated with the company I worked for to have two mornings a week. And again, I deliberately picked mornings because that's when I'm my most creative. And to sit down two mornings a week and just write. And what I would find, it's really interesting because now a lot, a lot of what I teach people is about the creative processes I've used as a designer. And I'd intrinsically been using one. Number one, working with my flow, working in the morning when I was at my best. But what I found is whenever I am doing something creative or any problem I've got in my life, I try and work it out. And then when it gets to a point where I get stuck, I just let it go and know that the back of my head is sorting it out. And so what I found worked really well with the book writing process is the Tuesday I would write something and then I would be mulling it over in my head. By the time I came back Thursday, I could get straight into it. Number one, because I was under time pressure and I had to do, get things done before I went to work. But I also then, I'd already sort of worked out a lot of that stuff in my subconscious so I could get it down. And then the same thing between the Thursday through the Tuesday, I would get ideas and I'd either scribble them down really quickly so they're out of my head and I remembered them, or they would be ready for me to just flow into again the following Tuesday. So the process for me worked really well and it was really tapping into what I do as a designer as part of that creative process where you've got to deliver on time, but you need to also be able to work at your most efficiently. So yeah, so I basically wrote the book fairly quickly because I love writing, I was in the flow and then yeah, four years roundabout before I, I started with the publishing. Yeah, well, that's that seems to be a pretty a pretty common trend. We we write, and then we rethink it, and we start wondering who's going to want to read this, and what <laughs> gives me the right to think they're going to want. And we start having these internal conversations with ourselves, and the next thing you know, it's months later, and the book still mm -hmm. hasn't been released. Um, in in my case, with my first book, it was a, one of my friends telling me that if I didn't publish it, she knew who my editor was and she was <laughs> going to take take it out of my hands, basically. That's accountability. <laughs> yeah, that's accountability. She she also gave me great feedback. She said, Max, I know one of the things you're worried about is the length of this book. She said, don't worry about that. It's the perfect size for women to carry around in their purses with them. <laughs> She's practical, too. I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> So you you did you uh, as a as a di as a designer and as an author. So you've gotten really good at the creative process and, and mm. doing it under a deadline. Mm. Uh, besides your Tuesday and Thursday thing, is there is there any other thing that's worked really well for you? Is are are there certain times of the year, certain clothes, smells, sounds, anything like that that? I I think. Um... 
Definitely. I, I try and do all my work in the morning. Like I, it's very unusual for me to do, it's because of our time difference that I'm doing this in the morning, but now I'd normally be buckled down and working because it's my creative time and I'm aware of that. So I usually don't schedule anything at all in the morning. And there's only um, basically one family member I'll take phone calls from in the morning and the rest can wait till the afternoon when I'm, I'm in a spot where I can really give them my full attention. Because in the morning I wake up and I'm like, ah, yeah, I've got to do this, this and this. And but what I've, I've always been structured, uh, as a designer, you have to be structured. And I think the biggest myth we have is that creativity is all about just flowing. The creativity actually needs structure around it. So for instance, some of the best designs I've seen have been when we've planned something, the builders started to dem demolition the place, and there's a column that's structural that we can't get rid of, and we suddenly need to change our design. In the end, we've still got to come back to the brief. We can't go away from what that is. We still need to deliver what those needs are for our client. But it makes us think differently about the space. It makes us be more creative because it's actually showing us something different from what we might have done. So I think people are often just coming back to our own self-development. We are so scared to go into those uncomfortable bits, but when we do, that's when the magic happens. That's when the real development happens. That's when we start to think differently or we're prodded and pushed to, to move on from where we're at, which is something that we've been resisting. So definitely I find that that structure is really important. As a creative, as I said, I've got structure about this is what I do in the mornings. I also batch everything together. So as you know, having been on my podcast, I do them over a two or three day period. And then it means everything's finished for that. I've done all the recordings. It's, you know, it saves me so much time. If you think about it, if I do 10 recordings and every time I got to get all my equipment out, then I got to stay and do all the intros and outros. That's at least an hour each time. Whereas if I do the setup once and two days later, pull it down, and do 10 interviews, I've probably saved myself, I don't know, eight hours just in something like that. So it's about thinking how you can work efficiently as well. It's a, for me, it's about creativity and structure. Okay, so what you're basically telling me for me is that I don't have enough structure in my life. <laughs> I didn't say that. Which, you're saying that. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not the first person to, to say it or imply it or to ask questions that lead to it. Um, and it's one of my, it's another question I don't, I don't look forward to in interviews because I don't have a good answer to what do you do, what does a, what does a day, what does a day in your, in your work or life look like? And it's because I don't have a, a thing, a set schedule every day or even, mm -hmm. even a, even a quote blogging or writing calendar. Um, <laughs> so I would probably, who knows, who knows what would happen if I actually got a schedule? I mean. <laughs> I have I have a schedule. What I, what I do is is every day I I add the the next uh, interview or uh, any type of a deadline I happen to have, and when I go to bed at night I look at the next the next day and see what the next day is, and that's what I worry about is what is the next day. But um, but I, I just can't imagine having the pressures of uh, a job plus your your work as a coach, plus the difference in the time that the time zone between Australia and the United yeah. States, that, that right there, I mean, I've had people who have joked about, you know, Max, you should move to Australia or uh, when the Midway marketplace opens an office in Australia, I want to go work there. And I'm like, you realize how hard it is to work in Australia. <laughs> We're pretty flexible. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I just have this, this deal with the time difference and it's, it's not even the same time difference all the, all the year or, or mm -hmm. across the whole country. People just don't realize how large a country Australia is as yeah. far as time zones are concerned. Yeah. And just to travel. Yes, absolutely. In fact, when you travel to Asia, you spend the first four hours just traveling across Australia and you're like, I only got two more hours to get there. And <laughs> I spend most of my trip in Australia still. <laughs> That sounds like going to California from Houston. You spend the first yes. half of your trip trying to get out of West Texas. <laughs> yeah, Texas is big. I love Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> what are some, since we've been talking about structure, what are some of your time management th things? Is there a particular app or, or method you use to keep you on schedule? 
again, it's one of those ones which I've learned, but I now know that there's a name for it, which is the Pomodoro effect. So it's about giving your brain a bit of space. So turning off everything to start with so that every message that comes through, you don't have to look at your phone, but I'll really just <laughs> sitting and, and I'm sure there's an app for that. Um, in fact, there is one, I can't remember what it's called. I'll message you afterwards about it. It's, it's one where you can actually look and see how often you open your phone throughout the day. And it is scary. <laughs> how many, and it will say how many times you've been on Facebook, how many times you've been on messenger, all these different places. It's yeah, it's scary for people. Yeah, anyway. but that, that is such a great start. Is the is the best way to find out how, the best way to change the way you approach time is to find out where you're spending your time. Just like mm -hmm. just like if you were going to create a budget, the first thing you'd do would be to go through your past expenses and see where you're spending your money. I love it. It's brilliant. Absolutely. I'll I'll find the name of that app and I'll send it to you. All right. Um, and I there's will, one for iTunes and one for for um, Androids. All right, and I will add that link when I write the post about this uh, for people so they can find it too, because that does sound like a brilliant way to approach this. Yeah, no, it's great. But yeah, so the really just concentrating on one thing at a time and really giving yourself its full focus and you're laughing. <laughs> I get so much grief over the fact that I do not multitask. I don't, I don't even try to multitask. I mean... Uh, the, the, one of the, one of the reasons why I didn't have my own podcast for, for such a long time was because I did not want to have to think about the, is the recording stuff working? Uh, mm -hmm. is the, you know, what is, how we're doing on time? You know, all that stuff that you have to think mm -hmm. about when you're, when you're, and I, so for me, it's really about being in the moment and I get, I get a lot of grief over not multitasking and I'm constantly telling other people, just slow down and focus on one thing at a time and they get mad at me. Wow, because multitasking is wasting so much time. I don't know how anyone can think that as they jump between something, are doing a task and then jumping to something else, most, apart from the amount of milliseconds we waste, how often do we come back and go, oh, what was it I was doing? Where was I at? <laughs> We actually say it to ourselves. So it's proving that we've lost that focus. So why not just focus and then stop? <laughs> and so, and, and it's called the Pomodoro effect, which as I said, I've just used it as part of the design process because it comes back to, you know, I'll be thinking about something. I get a little bit stuck. So I'll go and make myself a cup of coffee and I'm still thinking as I'm doing it, but I'm, I'm getting my decaf. And often by the time I come back to my desk, I've either solved the problem or I get onto something else and again, go back to that. But for me, the reason I do get a lot done is because I concentrate on something. And then after, when it's not working anymore, and the Pomodoro effect is, a, is basically say to work for about 25 minutes and then have five minutes off. And that's when you go to the toilet, check your phone, do what you need to, but make sure you come back and do that for a period during the day. And then you get to a point where you'll have a larger break. So you're actually got, giving yourself permission to have that fun check your Facebook, do all this stuff that you, you, that you find fun. But in the meantime, concentrate for 25 minutes and then go off. But for me, I find the time is different every time. It depends on where I'm at. I'm a little bit in the flow with that because I've learned to trust it. Who knew? I was a proponent of the Pomodoro effect. I just never <laughs> knew it. Huh? You know, and for years, I thought, for years, people called me cheap. And then I found out I was a minimalist. <laughs> Thought you'd like that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, my, my biggest tip is concentrate on that. Work when you, it's best for you to work. So understand your flow. And some people are night people. So I'm a more morning person. So work that out and do the stuff that's difficult at that time. And you know things like over summer when I was still working, but. I would go to the beach, oh, it's still summer here, but I would go to the beach um, at three o'clock when my energy levels, like most people, go down. I'd go to the beach and read my book. Now, my books, I love reading books on how to make your life better. So my books are on that. So I'm still learning, but I felt like I was relaxing. I was sitting at the beach. I took an hour out of my day feeling like I was having a break, but I was really still working. But I was working in that time when I was at an energy low and I was accepting that and finding another way to use that time. Yeah, I, I love that. One of the things that I do often is is to just, especially at that three, four o'clock in the day is a good is a good time for it, 
is to put on an audio book or if I haven't already mm -hmm. gotten my exercise in for the day to go out and ride my bike that doesn't go anywhere. So, yeah. uh, yep. but, I, but basically what we're talking about here is we're talking about, uh, we're talking about mindful, mindfulness and being in the moment mm -hmm. as opposed to multitasking and trying to do 10 or 12 different things at one time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you said something about we waste time, but to me, the other, the, more important thing about this multitasking thing that I just still just don't get it all is you don't have the opportunity to really enjoy anything that you're doing. Yes. Yeah. Completely agree. And that's what it's all about. Like for me, if we can, it, life is messy. There's going to be really bad times. There's going to be times when stuff happens that you wish it didn't, but we need to find a way to embrace that as best as possible. And I suppose a classic example is um, about just over a year ago, my mum passed away and, you know, that was obviously a horrible time, but there was real beauty amongst that too because what was happening is when she was in palliative care, all these people came and visited her and I sat there, and I'm getting shivers as I'm saying it, I sat there as people talked to my mum about the wonderful time she'd shared with her. And I don't know if you know, but apparently our hearing's the last thing to go when we're passing away. And from experience I had with mum, I believe it was right up to the end with her. Um, but what was sensational is it meant mum was listening to these people say how gorgeous their life with her was. So even though it was hard and it was you know, heartbreaking, in amongst that there was absolute beauty because I learnt more about my mum's past I reconnected with a lot of people I hadn't seen in years because I don't live in the same state. And so there was real beauty amongst, amongst that time as well. It wasn't just a sad time. So it's finding how in every aspect that comes into our life, how can we find something that we can connect with which makes it easier for us to manage, maybe more resilient, can help us through those tough times. So coming back to what you're talking about with our time management, Yes, let's enjoy things as much as possible and make it as easy for, as possible for ourselves. Well, that is very helpful, and I hope a lot of people will actually actually start doing it. I know a lot of people talk about mindfulness and being in the moment, but people still have trouble actually doing it. It's hard. And it is hard, yeah. And I'm, I'm talking with Tina Murray at tinamurray.com. She's an interior designer of people. And she's also a coach, speaker, author, and workshop director. And before I forget to ask you, do you have any major events coming up in the next few weeks or months that you would like to mention? Or is there something other than your website you'd like to mention? Yeah, I do. I've actually got um, an event coming up in Melbourne called Become the Architect of Your Life, which is I'm speaking at that. And it's about going through the design process I use to help people to understand. You create a brief. You come up with a concept of what you really want your life to be. You document it like we do with plans and then we build it and then we review it. And so really giving people some structure about how they can work out what it is that they want. Um, and then for International Women's Day in Adelaide, I've got an event coming up too about what does it mean to be a woman in 2018. Yes, it seems like there's a lot of, lot of flux with what it means to be a woman a woman. Uh, we seem to be going through a really crazy time as far as women taking more control and responsibility for their lives and for their position in the world. Mm, and men too, which is lovely. I'm loving the males that I'm working with because uh, they've often said to me that they feel like they can't talk to their mates about it. There's um, definitely some sense with a lot of guys that there's not someone they can talk to about it. And even some of the ones who are married, once... You know, when you're in a relationship, it's hard sometimes to see things and to talk through something. So having someone who they tell me that, you know, I'm, I'm an action taker, but I'm also empathetic. So I can listen to them and then I can go, go on, go out and do something about it now. <laughs> um, so I'm finding it's this, I think it's the beauty is it's hard when we've got too many choices. We're not made, we were not built back as a Stone Age person to be making all these choices. All we were meant to be doing was going out and killing a wildebeest, banging it on the head, 
cooking it, maybe having sex with our partner that night, going to sleep, getting up the next morning and doing the same thing again. Whereas we've got, we're inundated with choices these days. And so it's about having an idea about what it is that you want. So those choices, you don't get bamboozled by the 50 million choices that you get every day. You can actually concentrate on the ones that are important for you. Yeah, there are just way too many choices we have to make every day. And I mm. remember hearing about, back during the Cold War, I remember hearing about a, about the number of Russians and other Eastern Europeans who had sought sanctuary in the, in the West, who mm. after a few years wanted to go back just because mm. they, 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 they longed for that society where the central government was making all of those decisions, decisions. for them. Yeah, yep. Or in some and cases, I saw that, scarcity meant that they didn't, didn't have to make the decision because there wasn't anything to choose from. Yeah, exactly. And I saw a little bit of that. I was in Cuba last year, and which still has the government does make a, has a lot of restrictions on the people there. And it was really interesting just to see how, um, you know, they've got an ama- one of the best education systems in the world and a really amazing um, med- medical system. And I know because I ended up going to hospital there, unfortunately. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But the beauty of it, you know, and people there were really pleased about those things. And they, a lot of the people I spoke to understood that, um, unfortunately, it was a bit of a payoff, but they, in lots of ways, appreciated that because some of the decisions have been made for them and they've been taken care of in some pretty, pretty substantial ways. Well, I'd be crazy if I didn't ask you to, to tell us a little more about your trip to Cuba, even though it is, even though it <laughs> I mean, one of, the, one of the blessings about having a show is I can ask the question I want to, and if, if the, of course, the listener has the option of pressing pause, stop, or, or delete, but, you know, I feel like, why not? So, I would love to hear more about why you went there, and what, and what were some of the other things you experienced while you were in Cuba? I think I'd been wanting to go there for some time. It'd been one of those places, and I think because it hadn't been particularly open to the West, and... So I was glad to take the opportunity. Again, coming back to when you have opportunities, take them. And, and that was a funny thing, actually. I seriously only had two, not even two weeks between two workshops I was running. So I basically left run workshop the next day. I got on the plane and I came back and jet lag from Cuba, believe me. It's, I ended up going back through Houston. <laughs> it was, I think, a 33-hour flight all up back. It was dreadful. Um, but I got off and then the next day I, I ran another workshop. So... Talking about taking the opportunities, you know, um, I practice what I preach. But so I had wanted to, t- to do it. I loved the cars. Oh, my gosh, those old cars, sensational. And absolutely loved the architecture, like to see all the old architecture. It was just like going back into a, a time thing, which was amazing. Um, I think, you know, the, the gin was pretty good. <laughs> But on a level, the, you know, just the thing that really hit me, really stood out for me, there's no trucks on the road. I've travelled all over the world and, of course, trucks gets stuff around countries and gets it between countries, gets it to the airport or to the um, port to take it on a ship. And it really hit me there weren't that many trucks on the road because everything was so um, self-supporting in their own little towns there wasn't that much stuff traveling between the towns. And so that was huge for me because it was something I'd never thought of anywhere else in the world. And I was like, Oh, wow. I never, yeah, yeah, I've never seen so few trucks. Right. Well, one thing you have to remember is that the embargo has been going on Mm. for 50 years and prior to the embargo, they used to ship millions of pounds of coffee, sugar, tobacco and other products out of Cuba. Mm. But since the embargo and the sanctions, they haven't had as much traffic dealings with, Mm without with the outside world so exactly. i bet you at one time they probably did have quite a bit of trucking there's just no need for it in in their world today yep exactly and i'll be interested to see what happens with cuba i've also been told that uh that prior that contrary to what we would expect that cuba is uh, pretty protected pristine as far as their environment goes what was did you mm. notice yeah absolutely um really beautiful when you get out to the country it is absolutely beautiful and it is clean and and i think too because people are so well educated and because the health system's so good the, you know, i've 
I've been to a lot of countries which are third world countries and you know there's um, a whole different level in what you experience there but yeah really clean really pristine a real I think the thing that really stood out for me with the Cuban people apart from the, the fact they love dancing was the um, they're real they're really proud about their country which was lo- which was lovely to say well, that's good to hear how about their attitude I've I have heard that even though they live under this regime, that they're generally a pretty positive, happy people. Mm. Yeah, we were lucky enough to be staying in doing homestays. So we meant wherever we went, we were staying with different families. And absolutely, like, so positive, so generous. And yeah, the, yeah, I really, I, maybe it's just because they dance. Maybe it's like when I was in Ghana and Africa where people are in absolute poverty, but they dance and so they're happy. They're getting those good, feel-good hormones going through. I don't know. But um, there was definitely a sense of fun and positivity. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my, my dad always used to say that he didn't understand the words to the music, to the Mexican music here in, or the Tejano music. He said, but it's hard to see how you could be, you could be unhappy when you listen to their music. Mm-hmm. So the music and the dancing and the rum and the gin, they could all, could all go together. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I have heard that there is some, there is a, there is some fear that if uh, Cuba were to ever become opened up to the rest of the world again, that the introduction of more modern hotels, golf courses, et cetera, would ruin a lot of their environmental uh, 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 a lot of the environment in Cuba. Okay. And that's what yeah. that's kind of... I suppose it depends. I mean, I've been to some other places in the world which have been pristine, and as um, one in particular, I was riding a bike through for a month, and it we were driving riding through places where most people probably wouldn't go, and there were some spots where they were starting to build resorts, and it definitely was... I can see it was very quickly going to change the face of what those villages were, were like. So, yeah, I think there's a fine line with, you know, that sort of thing. And, and I'm really conscious of that as a designer working in architectural offices that, you know, there, there's a responsibility of governments in particular, um, local governments and, and even us as architects, to look about sustainability. And that's not just about the actual environment and um, and how we affect it, it's also about, well, what does that mean for jobs in the area? What does it mean with the local landscape? How does it change that? Um, does it bring more trucks on, which we're carving up the roads, whatever? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very, it's a huge town planning issue. Well, I am personally glad that we're starting to see more emphasis on sustainability and we're starting to have more people out there who have, who, who understand that they're, that it isn't a binary choice. It isn't, you can actually make money off of doing things that are environmentally helpful. Mm, absolutely. And it's funny, I'm seeing more and more that companies are understanding that a big part of what their staff are wanting is to be able to be giving back. So whether that means they give time for their staff to go and donate their time or they their staff can give some of their money to different charities or the cha- or the um, company itself supports charities and I really love that because as human beings I I believe a, one of our common needs is we do want to be able to um, be connected and also support other people and take care of other people in whatever way that that form that can take okay well <clears throat> before I finish up with you I just what it, <laughs> what is uh, what is one thing or uh, one uh, one quote from you personally that you could tell people that would help them to to find out, you know, to get down to who they who they really are, who they really want to be, so they can they can get out of this place they're at now and actually start moving forward. Sure. So coming back to the design processes, I say design it, communicate it, and live it. So design what you want communicate it to yourself and everyone around who's going to support you do it or even just to say no and then go out there and live it like no excuses as you say <laughs> and just go out and do it so design yeah. it communicate it and live it right and where can they find you online uh, www.tinamurray.com and also i'm on facebook and instagram as well under tina murray well thank you i um I really appreciate you coming on and spending some time with me and uh, 
I've really enjoyed talking to you uh, both times now. And uh, <laughs> as as we like to say here, people, if if Tina can do this, if I can do this, then what is your excuse? Mm. Love it. Thank you so much, Max. As always, it's divine speaking with you and I am going to get you to be doing my intros from now on. <laughs> okay, so we had yet another wonderful interview. I I think I may have had more fun than you did, or uh, maybe Tina had more fun than you did. I'm not sure. I'm just, I really enjoy talking with her. She has so much good advice, information, and suggestions to share. And I do think it is, it is important that not only did she talk about build it or design it, but she talked about communicating it. And to me, that, and, you know, to, to many of my friends who are online as bloggers, podcasters, or authors, that seems to be the big problem is when you start communicating that you're going after this new goal or dream and people, you know, they don't respect it. They don't trust it. They don't understand it. And a lot of cases, you know, it's just so different than what they're used to, to seeing and expecting out of you that they can't come to terms with it. And of course, also there are times when one of us taking those steps towards a, a bigger goal or a more fulfilled life, uh, makes the people around us see themselves as less. And that's not what's intended. We're not trying to make them look bad or feel bad. We're just trying to do a little more with our own lives. And so I thought what she was talking about there with communicating it right there at the end, uh, you know, not only to people, but also communicating what you will accept and, and saying no when you need to say no. So that was really important from her. And I, and I think you can see that, uh, you know, we did have fun doing this. I honestly believe that if you're doing a podcast or a blog, it gets to the point where it's not fun anymore. You really need to figure out, well, why isn't it fun anymore and see if there's something you can do to address that. Uh, I love how she talked about being mindful and focusing on one thing at a time because, as you all know, I stink at multitasking. I'm really bad at it. So... I think she had a lot of good stuff to give you. I hope that when this goes live that I'll get some comments from people who will tell me what it is that they have decided to construct, communicate, and live. So until next time, I want to thank you again for spending some time with me. I know you have a lot of things in your life, in your daily schedule. You don't have a lot of free time, so I know that when you decide to spend some of it with me, it's a, it's a decision, it's a gift, it's a blessing, so thank you. Uh, you can find me at theblindblogger.net, theblindblogger.net, on Twitter at Maxwell Ivy, youtube.com slash Maxwell Ivy. If you have a question or just want to say hello, you can use the contact form on my website. I am seeking to do more, uh, more public speaking, more traveling, and more writing. And that brings me to my latest book, The Blind Bloggers, New York City Adventures, How You Can Make Your Dreams Come True. And not only is it an entertaining story about my trip to New York City, but it has a lot of very good life lessons in it. I've already started to get replies from people who tell me how inspiring the book is. I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to doing more, sharing more of the book, and uh, I can't wait to find out what my next adventure is going to be. So until next time, thank you, God bless you, and take care out there. And there's bound to be rough waters, and I know I'll take some falls. But with the good Lord as my captain, I can make it through them all. I will sail my vessel till the river runs dry like a bird upon the wind. These waters are my sky, I'll never reach my destination, if I never